Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, alive, it's alive, it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. And welcome back to The Wilder Ride, where we are getting wilder by the minute, a podcast that celebrates the films of Gene Wilder one minute at a time. I'm your host, I'm Alan Sanders. And I'm your co-host, Walt Murray. You want to do that again? Yes, I do. (laughs) And I'm your co-host, Walt Murray. And joining us today, two guys who were so kind enough to have us on their podcast, The Radio Labyrinth, we are welcoming Tim Andrews and Jeff Leboff to the show this week. Welcome, guys. Hey, guys. How are you? <laughs> Doing great. I want to say first and foremost, again, how much we thank you guys for putting us on your show a few months back. It gave us a chance to start teasing that audience. They had a sense that this was coming. We had our zero episode out there for folks to kind of just get a sense of how this show was going to sound, who each of us was in terms of our as co-host and co-host of this. And so thank you so much for doing that for us. That was a pleasure. We had a good time. Thank you guys for coming on. That was a great episode. So I was going to ask, did you get any feedback from that? Any negative <laughs> comments? Never have those two bozos on your show again? <laughs> no, I think a few, uh, you know, a few of our subscribers, I think, ended up subscribing to you guys as well. So hopefully there was a little uh, crossover between the episodes. Well, that's awesome. I love that. I love hearing that. Well, Tim, why don't you tell us a little bit about your show so our listeners know what y'all are doing over there? All right. Our show is called Radio Labyrinths. Uh, we generally talk about, you know, TV shows that we're watching at the time, movies, podcasts, anything primarily in pop culture, we're talking about it. And of course, we go down rabbit holes. We are certainly not clean, so it is uh, not a podcast for kids, but it's it's a lot of fun. We do improvised comedy and voices, and, and uh, it's me, Jeff, Steph Swain, Ira Malkin, and, and uh, Autumn Fisher from the Von Hessler Doctrine. Yeah, you guys have some fantastic voice talent, and I know sometimes there's not every Everybody there it kind of goes and comes depending on vacation and scheduling and whatever but such a cool group of folks yeah maybe not the maybe not clean <laughs> but we are a clean podcast but that's okay you guys can be yourselves i take care of all of that in post-production well and every week i listen to your show i'm like oh great another show i gotta listen to another podcast i gotta catch up on <laughs> so uh, so I, I enjoy it and I, I think a lot of our listeners would as well yeah. Well, thanks. It, and it happens. You you subscribe to a bunch of different ones and then you end up, you know, you just don't have time to listen to the radio. What, what I love about it and what I love about podcasting now in general is you can binge listen when you find when you stumble across something. You can go back and just listen, uh, especially with a show like this that sort of is breaking down a movie one minute at a time. Or like you, I could just t- look at the subjects and say, hey, I want to listen to that particular one or that particular one. I can just line them all up and just go out there and, I don't know, weed whack for two hours while I'm entertained. Right. I tried to get totally caught up on uh, on the Wilder Ride, but I, I'm only on episode 51. So, oh, if, if, you're you're close. You're close. You're coming up on the halfway <laughs> point. I actually am very impressed. There's a lot of folks who just, and I get it, people have busy schedules. It's really hard to have everything there all caught up. But I appreciate that, Jeff. That's fantastic. I know you are a huge Gene Wilder fan, and you actually made us feel a little nervous getting on the Radio Labyrinth, making sure that we we knew enough <laughs> to be worthy of being on with you. Well, I mean, you guys obviously are big fans of his so i just wanted to make sure that everybody that was going to be listening to you would take gene wilder seriously and not disrespect his memory but make it legitimate you know what i'm you know what i'm saying no absolutely and i think we're we're having a lot of fun but we also we love his work and i think uh, obviously that's why we we picked the podcast to, to title it the way we did rather than just looking at only one movie we're looking to hopefully go through several of the films of gene wilder that we grew up loving or discovering even in uh, young adulthood to maybe even uh, later adulthood uh, have you guys figured out what movie you're doing next yet? We have a pretty good idea, but we're not going to tell it now. <laughs> anyway, tell the final episode. I could, I could give, a, I could wait a second, I, I, and I could cut this later, but I could give a very thinly veiled clue. I could say it has something to do about where Choo Choo go, but that might <laughs> that might lead you down a few different trails. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, well, let's get to it. Let's go ahead and get into minute number 86. When we last left on Friday, the lift from up above Walt was lowering down. We didn't see anybody at the wheel, so we have to continue to talk about that. But the lift was lowering as Frau Bluka was looking for the good doctor. So we'll start minute 86 today with the lift continuing to lower. And we discover Dr. and Inga having an intellectual conversation, as he calls it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know how, how much conversation there was. And we will end with Elizabeth saying, darling, and Dr. Frankenstein, or now Frankenstein, saying, da, and we don't know what else he says because he kind of gets caught in mid-sentence. So let's start off first and foremost. The lift is lowering at this point. Walt, there was a huge scene 20 minutes earlier in the movie where it required Inga and Igor to be on that giant wheel cranking the lift all the way up and then all the way back down. What happened in the space of teaching Frankenstein's monster how to tap dance? Well, they definitely improved the technology because I did. That was one of the first things I looked for, and he had his thumb on a switch. Uh, as it was coming down. So obviously they have improved the technology of the lift system there. Uh, I want to get uh, Jeff to weigh in on this. The first time you went through watch this, did it at all catch your eye as to how did this lift all of a sudden become automated? No, I didn't even think about that until you mentioned that. That's a good catch. I mean, he's got in his hand, like, the, I guess what you would use to raise and lower any kind of an automated, like, steel garage or kind of an industrial lift. So I'm guessing that there must be some some shop that goes around Transylvania to help install these in mad scientist laboratories. <laughs> yeah, it looks like the union got in and has, uh, has caught a lot of problems. Hey, in the you lab. know, we don't have Fritz mentioned in here. Igor kind of has taken that part. Maybe it's Fritz's garage. <laughs> 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 Throw him on the rack, do an oil change between uh, between reanimations. Yeah, well, I'm thinking... It's nice because earlier in the film, it's a, it's a big dusty place. They can't even get the lights on. There's cobwebs everywhere. And uh, by the by the time they're lowering it down, it's completely modern and chill. And you feel you, you get the feeling that he's he knows his way around that lab now a lot better than he did at first. Maybe besides Fritz's, you know, uh, installation facility, maybe there's a cleaning crew that goes around, helps clean up all of your mad scientist messes and spills, you know, when the lab blows up or when the monster goes on a terror. What was it called? In, you're a, a former, uh, you're son of an FBI guy. You're an investigator, Walt. What do they call those guys like, like the, the mob had that would go clean up behind you? Oh, uh, the cleaners? Is that what they call them? The cleaners? Well, that's, uh, yes. One of the guys that I've interviewed, that was his former, <laughs> former job was a cleaner. Oh, should we all have a cleaner in our lives? We all should. Yes, I have. Well, here you got a cobweb problem. You need to help getting rid of those cobwebs. Eh? It's a little more expensive than you'd expect. I, I ha <laughs> Am I to understand you have a certain problem, a certain six-foot-tall problem that sort of needs to go away? Well, it's, it's possible. Well, I always laugh when um, – I, I mean, I guess I shouldn't laugh, but I've got a weird sense of humor – Whenever somebody gets arrested, it's like everybody who tries to hire a hitman ends up hiring a, a uh, an FBI agent. And uh, so you see, all, you know, every couple months in the news, somebody tried to hire a hitman and it was a cop. Yeah. Maybe there are no hitmen. They're only FBI agents. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. Now. All the good hitmen are gone. They've moved to gross point blank. <laughs> all the button men are out. <laughs> Well, did you notice how excited Frau Bluka was as the um, as the tables are coming? Like that is the most celebratory raising of hands and and chanting when that thing starts down. And I don't know if she was surprised or excited, but uh, that was a, 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 a kind of an over the top reaction from her. Yeah, you're talking like at the very second here, the very start, mm -hmm. where because when we last left her, she didn't know where the voice was coming from. Right, and now all of a sudden she looks up and she's like, "Oh, praise be, there yeah, he right. is." <laughs> Yeah, it's a, she's really excited. Well, as this begins to lower, um, guys, you didn't know this uh, because you probably, as you came over, you know, we realized it's a transatlantic flight, so you probably missed Friday's episode. You, you got to get all caught up. But we discovered in the script that was taken out of the actual film, just as Inga is kissing Dr. Frankenstein's fingers, there was an extended scene that was taken out where he says, no, we can't do this. And she's like, I understand. He said, we can't be physical. She goes, I know. And they keep talking. He said, but, you know... 
if we're not fooling around physically, I guess it's okay maybe fooling around intellectually. As long as we're just being intellectual, we can do that. And she's like, of course, doctor. And basically, we're going to have to remember that coming up because right. there's going to be a line that doesn't make a lot of sense unless you knew the cut lines that were in this past Friday. But obviously, while while she was kissing his fingers, we noticed that they cut to basically fade it out with Frau Bluka coming in. We now know apparently what the doctor and the good, uh, I don't know, laboratory assistant have been up to. Uh, yeah, trading intellectual uh, thoughts, I think, is what was going on there. Yeah, studying some strange nocturnal <laughs> habits. <laughs> so, Tim, I got to ask you this. You know, you're a, you're a radio media entertainment guy. Do you always have, you know, do you have those coy conversations with people to figure out how you can get someone in bed? No, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. I'm married. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe beforehand. Well, uh... I don't know. Usually there was an exchange of money. (laughs) (laughs) Well, she is the laboratory assistant, so she's already on the payroll. She is trying on the payroll. (laughs) So was that 30 roses or 60? (laughs) Right. She could meet to him, you know, being being the fact that uh, he was the boss. But, you know, they they probably don't have that problem now (laughs) in in modern day uh, laboratories. Well, the rules are a little fast and loose in Transylvania. They they they, they skip right. a lot of steps. Yeah, they have werewolves and and vampires and and Frankenstein's monsters. So and brain stores. That, uh, yeah, they can get away with a little being a little flirtatious and sexual harassment. <laughs> well, you know, and, the, and when you look back, she initiated here. He was he was sort of all upset about him being chained and locked in the basement of the prison, and he just feels so bad for his creature. It wasn't until she decided to, I don't know, kiss one finger at a time, and he started going mm, 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 that this led to this. Yeah. It- See, I don't understand going back through the film why she falls for him or or what it is that that turns her on about him is it because is it because he becomes a mad scientist and and why does uh, Frau Bluka seem like she wants it to happen like it's preordained you know d- or maybe I'm way off base but that's it's kind of like everything is this is supposed to happen yeah I, I have kind of the same question and well you not know, on you... Frau Bluka we talked about that a few episodes back that we know her motivation has been all along but yeah, as far she's as been orchestrating as everything. far as Inga well, I want to, I want Jeff to weigh in first because Jeff is a huge fan as well. I want to get his two cents before I give you a I don't know my sh- <laughs> be thoughts. It seemed to me like it was a spur of the moment thing. I mean, obviously it was scripted to happen, but it just she was trying to unblock him mentally for you know he was trying to think of a solution to for a way to fix the monster to make it less abnormal and more normal, and he wanted to. I forget what it was, something about the the spinal fluid. He was trying to think of a way to balance the spinal fluid. He was having a mental block. And she was like, if, if there was only something I could do to help you just relax and consider this problem, you know, that was like the impetus for her kissing his fingers. And then that led to this. Well, here's the thing that if you look back, there was that mistaken conversation when they were starting to actually perform the resurrection ceremony itself, where he said, I need you to elevate me. And she goes, oh, oh, here, doctor? And like, you know, she heard it one way and he meant it another way. So <laughs> we got the idea that at least, in, well, I'll, I'll say I got the idea, because I'm not sure if Walt agrees with me yet or not, that sometimes when you've got a junior assistant or somebody that, you know, is helpful in the lab, but they're not maybe necessarily the brilliant doctor, they're not the brilliant scientist or a brilliant inventor, and you see the passion that somebody has for their work, you get so into that person's passion for what they're doing that that passion becomes almost like a bridge to developing your own passion for that person because it's infectious. You feel like, wow, look what they're doing. I want to be part of that. And the more you start thinking, I want to be part of that, you start imagining yourself going further than just maybe a working relationship. It's like the admiration leads to perhaps the first sense of there's more here than just work. There's there's a sense of I want to be part of this. Right. She's swept swept up in in his, the wake of his brilliance. Yeah, and she's been kind of flirtatious from the beginning. Well, not really. Remember? Because she only did the yeah. role in Zahe. But That's after true. that, we realized, okay, it was just a game. It was yeah. just She was just singing a little song, and he realized, okay, she's not for real. Because they've never had any real indication. It's just sort of subtly showed up with the elevate me joke. 
Yeah, that's true. And and I guess it was, it has not been that overt until then. No, so. it hasn't. It's It's been very subtle. I th- and actually, I'm kind of glad Terry Gar plays it that way because we sense she's sending him messages. He's not receiving them. Yeah, he is not <laughs> not receiving them at all until... Until now. Until now. <laughs> so so um, I guess uh, symbolically, the two of them got together and required it to be uh, some object had to be raised as high as it could go. And now that they're done, it's okay to lower said object. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've said it all. <laughs> Thankfully, I don't have to push a button for mine. <laughs> I wish you could. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not quite that old where I'm like, I need to start looking at electronic gear or <laughs> other artificial means of raising myself to the heavens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because that's where the good lightning strikes take place. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you well, Terry find... Gar circa 1974 probably um, didn't hurt. Oh, no. No, not at all. No, in fact, lowering here, when they first come down and you realize that there's just a sheet over the two of them, and they're obviously having finished doing the old posturepedic polka upstairs, and they're coming back down. He's got a cigarette in his mouth. She's just sitting there clasping his hand that's underneath her neck as kind of a pillow. It's actually, I, I look at Terry Gar, I'm like, it's, it's kind of hot. <laughs> well, oh, and, yeah. And I think that the weird thing about this scene to me is when Frau Bluka comes and says, oh, you know, by the way, Elizabeth is on her way. The reaction is kind of odd. You know, he isn't like, oh, send her away. I've now got this other interest. And it isn't a, you know, panic of, you know, scrambling around. It's just kind of a matter of fact. Oh, okay. My my fiance is here. And you yeah, know, but let's remember that the, the scene that was cut out, he doesn't think that they've necessarily, quote unquote, fooled around physically. No, well, he talked her yeah. into saying, well, as long as we're only being intellectual. Right. I need a get out of jail free card like that. Honey, honey, honey. It it was just an intellectual conversation <laughs> I was having. Well he did he did tell Frau Bluka that they were working, so <laughs> they yeah, are yeah. true. He <laughs> considers that part of the work. Yeah. How many times have I told you not to interrupt me while I'm working? Experimental. <laughs> Well, in order to be a, have a good um, philosophical conversation, one must be a cunning linguist. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you have to pound at it all night long to just get it done. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh. There's a rhythm to it. <laughs> you do. And if, and if you're careful, you can make sure it lasts. Otherwise, you could actually blow it too soon. Well, yeah, it's that that usually happens to me. People aren't interested after thirty seconds. <laughs> yeah, honey, would you like an intellectual conversation? Sure, but what, what do we do after three minutes? <laughs> <laughs> um, there is actually uh, he does chide the good Frau Bluka at first about saying that he does not want to be interrupted, but Frau Bluka says, "I'm sorry, doctor. I thought it was an emergency. Your fiance will be arriving at any moment." How? Freaking slow was that telegram when you know it takes a good two weeks to get over here. Yeah, and it arrives just as she's getting there. I have a theory. Remember what I said about Elizabeth? It's a little kind mm-hmm. of like it's all about her, all kind of conniving. I don't think as much as she is caterwauling herself, I don't think she trusts Freddie. I think she sent the telegram just as she arrived. Oh, yeah, very well could be. She did not send it leaving New York. She waited till she was on platform 29. Can you get a shine? Maybe the same kid got, met her out there and asked her for a shoe shine. Yeah, sent the uh, sent the telegram and. But I think so. I think. Well, what, let me ask you guys because uh, our theory on this, at least mine and Walt, I think you kind of agreed with me yeah, way back I can, I can that, that the whole scene way back the last time that, and of course we're only hearing about Elizabeth. We'll catch her toward the end of this minute. But the last time we saw her was in minute number fourteen when she was left on the train station, not wanting to kiss him hug him, touch him. He wasn't allowed to do anything with her except finally rub elbows. Even when he threw a kiss, she tried to duck out of the way. So I theorized she only likes Freddie for the fact he's a doctor and brings prestige, but she really has some other guys on the side to take care of uh, the more physical needs of Elizabeth. Plus her her dress was taffeta or something, It was taffeta. (laughs) So, but what do you think about that theory? Because we've had some of our listeners in the listeners group, females especially, say, no, no, you're totally misreading it. She's a virgin. She spent all this time getting ready. She's a socialite, so she just didn't want to mess up her hair or her nails or her dress or her makeup. Do you buy that? I don't. I think that it's, you know, you're going to get to it later, and I won't spoil the scene, but with the relative ease with which she changes her position, (laughs) um, I, I think that that's a great theory, and 
it kind of explains everything. And I, I think you see it you, because uh, without spoiling it, which I'd have to do in order to prove my point, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Look, you could give me maybe seven or eight reasons why that, you know, people just do things and leave. Yeah. Yeah. But we can save that. We don't want to give any spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Je- Jeff. Jeff, what about you? Uh, I think she and she and the doctor were definitely not intimate. And I, I believe it kind of came off as they were going to wait until they got married kind of thing. So, um, so you because, buy you buy into Elizabeth's like hold off, you know, it's worth waiting. And the reason she doesn't want to touch him, hug him, get a get a, even a feel from him is all legit that she really has to go to a party and is afraid of messing up her hair and her nails and everything else. I believe so. And, and plus, it's kind of funnier that they're, you know, that he's frustrated by her. Interesting. In, in that way. I mean, I, you could argue at this point, I think either way, Walt. Yeah, and, and I know some of the listeners got mad at me. <laughs> some of them got real mad at me <laughs> because I had said that Elizabeth was kind of shallow and vapid and, and self-absorbed. But I, 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 still, I don't know that I've changed my position on that. I, I think that she is just a – she's very into her thing. I think we're going to see some more of that in the in the coming minutes, as Tim said. But I just I, – I think that she is very into her own own thing. Yeah. I agree with you. I think that she's, you know, she she's completely wrapped up being a socialite. And and I do like the theory that she she has been on the side. I, I think so. I think she's a socialite. She's not really into him, but she wants a doctor. He's right. a prestigious, you know, professor, physician. See, I think he represents the step in the socialite ladder because he's a prestigious doctor, but she's got needs and she takes care of those needs. And in her mind, well, that's okay because I'm marrying a doctor down the road so I can pretend to be, you know, the still sweet as the virgin snow or pure as the virgin's wind driven snow. I'll get the right analogy here in a second. Whatever it is. Pure as the wind driven snow uh, right. to him. But, you know, she's got needs. It's it's 1974 disco. Right. She's going to, you know, <laughs> Club 54. She's got to go. You know, she's she's not. I think in her mind, much like Dr. Frankenstein now has convinced Inga that they're not fooling around physically. It's just as long as it's intellectual. I think it's the exact opposite for Elizabeth. Elizabeth says, as long as it's not intellectual, it's just physical. It doesn't really mean anything. Good yeah. Point. Yeah, I think that's a good point. So, and and the, I think that they did a great job of making those two characters really polar opposites of each other. In fact, if if what I just said holds then that continues the whole do, you know mirror image we see of them where they're completely at the opposite sides of the spectrum from one another. They're completely not right for each other, and yet they keep trying to bring themselves together, but it's not going to work. Yeah, and we'll have, to, um, we'll have to see if that plays out in the next few minutes. One of the things that I think is uh, moving into the scene a little further after he f- reads about the telegram, she han- he hands his cigarette to Frau Bluka. I just think it's hysterical when she decides she <laughs> wants to take a big puff of it too, and <laughs> as if, yes, it's good for me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just think Cloris Leachman is, is so awesome in this movie. I mean, she there's so much talent here anyway, but she really does such a great job with her character. She is just fantastic. Jeff, I wanted to ask you, because you, this is the first time we've had either of you guys joining us, and it is later in the movie. Your thoughts on, on Cloris Leachman as far as her, the kind of actress and, and her role as Frau Bluka? Oh, Frau Bluka is hilarious and amazing, and not to step on anybody else's minutes, but the whole, he was my boyfriend scene was probably her best, my favorite of her scenes in, in the movie. Oh, it's definitely, especially the whole, yes, yes, yes. yes. And the the violin is <laughs> pounding up and down the bow on the, on the violin. There's so much imagery here if you want to look for it to go and, along with what's happening. The music is like percussion for the scene. It's like adding drama and, and it builds and builds and builds and you're expecting something, so it's something much different than what she, she, when she comes out with, he was my boyfriend. Boyfriend, <laughs> it just wasn't what you were expecting at all. I mean, even though you knew them, you knew that they had been together or whatever, but he didn't expect her to be like, "He was my boyfriend." Yeah, it's <laughs> it's almost a silly phrase for an adult to use. You know, it's like you yeah. would expect my lover or my secret husband or something, but my boyfriend. You almost expect her to be wearing his varsity letter jacket. <laughs> <laughs> When he does bark the order, though, just before he hands the cigarette over to her, it, and they all flinch when he's like, I told you never to disturb me when I'm working. Right. And they all like, and I wonder if that's one of those Gene Wilder moments that we've hear about Walt since we've been going through this, where sometimes, depending on the number of takes, he would do something like that and they would just flinch, like, because he they weren't expecting him to shout. 
Yeah, because he does cat. It does seem like he catches everybody else off guard. Both of them do kind of kind of jump scare there. <laughs> jump scare. <laughs> well, you sh- he's the one who should be getting the jump scare at this point, getting yeah, the message Elizabeth's Elizabeth about coming. to arrive. Um, what do you think of Frau Bluka's line <laughs> about? I suggest you put a tie on. Yeah, obviously, just a tie probably wouldn't work with this guy. <laughs> I guess it depends where you place the ties. <laughs> guess you're not looking down there anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, well, it was, it was yeah. Of course, Frau Bluka doesn't know that, but he, you know, obviously she she re- she recognizes this could be awkward if Elizabeth were to walk in at this moment. So basically, I suggest you two put some clothes well, on. Let's get it together. Right. right. We immediately go from that. It, it's sort of, I think it does a split sort of wipe. It yeah, kind of splits same. directly in the middle. And we have yet another one of these same tracking shots. Well, we talked about it back in minutes, I think it was minute four, the very first time we moved from the credits in front of the castle to in the courtyard. We're still watching the opening credits. And then we watched it as Igor was pulling in. So this is, again, a very similar tracking shot. So I wonder how many of these they all shot back to back to back with the same tracks or do they have to relay them down because it looks almost identical to that camera sweep. There's no fog this time, right? but it's a very similar looking shot from the very, quote, opening the movie as well as later when Igor brings Dr. Frankenstein for the first time. It does. It looks like that same track. So, um, and again, I'm impressed every single time they show this uh, front entrance of the detail that they went to and... I always forget that this is a 1974 movie, not a 1935 movie. Right. Um, of course, when they do this tracking shot, too, and, and guys, depending where you are in terms of catching up, we've got the carving on the far side of the screen there where it basically looks like one of the uh, carvings is holding his Schwanstucker and everybody's kind of looking down at him, either pointing or laughing. So that's prominently in the shot as we go past this uh, dead tree, the cobblestone line park, uh, or, or I guess it's a drive or sort yeah. of an entryway. And I don't know enough about some of these older cars, but is this typical that you would put the actual break on the outside of the door like a stagecoach? Yeah, some of the old old cars. Yeah, that's exactly where it was. Huh. You guys have any thought on that? I mean, because Walt seems pretty confident. I didn't know if that, that I've never seen in any older movie the, the, the crank there, but I guess is that is that something you guys know about? No, I thought, I thought that was just a way to open the open the door, but I didn't I didn't realize that that was the break. Yeah, he's yeah, pulling. I thought it was the door hand. You know, he's pulling back on the thing to hold the uh, hold the, the 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 car in place because then he reaches his hand back through the window to open the back door or the rear door to let Elizabeth out, where she pops out and says, "Darling." So, right. you know, he's the driver. He's not getting out. He's he just definitely right. put the brake in place. Sure. Yeah, and I don't know enough about cars to know what model that was, but it would have had to have been a really old car. At least there's a luggage rack on top. Um, Yeah, that's true. (laughs) That's true. I was wondering during that scene how the car got up there, because you see all the shots of the castle before they go there. You know, it's a castle on a mountain. It's spooky. It's eerie. It's and, you know. They took what a horse-drawn carriage there. Correct. Well, a horse, a, a wagon <laughs> cart. No, wagon. Oh, a, yeah, yeah. A, a hay wagon. wagon. Hay, hay wagon. wagon. Yeah. That's what it's called. So, so who knew? But I guess you know, there's a car there. But to get it back to what Walt said, the scenery and the tracking shot, and and how you you can't tell if it's a '74 movie or a 1935. They did a really good job recreating that. And I think they had to do it in black and white or you wouldn't have had that feel. Yeah, and you know, that's come up several times. I was gonna ask both of y'all what what your feelings are that I I've I've said, Alan said over and over again, that if this was a color film, the feel would be completely different. And I, I think it would have been I don't think it would have been as good a movie in color as it is in black and white. What do y'all think? Yeah, I definitely can't picture it as being in color. I guess we'll have to wait and see if Ted Turner ever <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gets his mitts on it and <laughs> colorizes it. Ruins I'm going to color everything. I don't care. I'm sitting in my, I don't even own it no more. <laughs> Ted. Ted's joined us. This is awesome. Hashtag. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that it had to be in black and white. Just to, could, Because what it is, it's an homage to those films with Mel Brooks's sensibilities and in, in, in his comedy. But, it, you know, and it keeps that, that feeling, that eerie feeling that you got from those old films, even though you're laughing. 
While we watch the car pull up, we do see that the three of our friends from the laboratory are up and dressed appropriately. Uh, looks like Dr. Frankenstein has, looks like a, a sort of the beginnings of a tux. I don't know if he's got the jacket on underneath this long sort of dinner robe. Inga's in a nice evening dress. Igor's back in his hood and his <laughs> humped back cloak. Because you know? <laughs> the hump was gone, remember, back a few minutes ago during mm-hmm. the putting on the Ritz scene where he's like, oh, it doesn't come out at night, which was another cut line. But <laughs> where's your hump? Oh, it doesn't come out at night. <laughs> but he, everybody's all back to normal. And and they're all doing their best to kind of, eh, look, nothing's going on here. He's got his hands clasped in front of him. She's got her hands clasped in front of her. There's no holding hands. There's no indication. In fact, Igor sort of almost between them is like, look, nothing to see nothing here. Nothing to see here. <laughs> <laughs> now, the scene is going to come to an end just as Madeline Kahn, as Elizabeth, her, very fr- her, her, her return from so many minutes ago, gets out of the car. She's got... it. it is this typical to wear what looks like the entirety of a of a fox eating itself as a necklace or a, some kind of a draped accoutrement? I mean, it looks like he's got his own tail or his own back leg. I can't tell which, but is that a typical style of dress for this day? 1974? 1974. <laughs> I mean, the totally. 30s. Yeah, 30s maybe. So once again, you know, we're, we're kind of being transported artificially we just assume it's 1930 all well, the time she's got her her evening gloves and her head scarf um she's definitely dressed for the 30s not the 70s i just have never seen a white is that a is it a wolf is it what is that that's eating its own catching its own tail arctic fox arctic fox maybe that's what yes. it is and probably it was done white because of the contrast for the color well that does being it, black it, it does help it stand out, no doubt. Mm-hmm. But um, that's going to play prominently here in the next coming minutes because, oh, oh, just keep this in mind, I've said that Igor is sort of like the family dog. He's always channeling his canine instincts throughout this entire film. He definitely is, and he really shines uh, coming up in the next few minutes. As we begin to start to wrap up this minute, we do see Marty Feldman actually in the scene. He wasn't throughout the first minute here, most of the first minute. He's just coming out now. I want to get your thoughts, either of you, on, on Marty Feldman since this is, again, your first First time joining us. I, I love Marty Feldman, all of his work, and uh, this was the first movie I ever saw him in. But I later went back and followed more of his his pictures that he was in, and he was he was a comic genius. I thought, and his uh, his impression coming up uh, was another, another. It crossed over into another one of my fandoms of the Marx Brothers. Awesome. Yeah, we got that a nice tease for tomorrow. What about in terms of just his character? I know this is a bit, you've loved this movie, Jeff, and you've watched it over and over, but have you ever just kind of sat back and sort of only watched him to just see what is he doing? Because a lot of the times he may not even have a line in a scene, and yet he's always in the moment. Right, and I was going to bring that up on the, on the next minute also. I'm sure you guys have seen some of the outtakes from that minute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we got to save that for tomorrow. Yeah. But I will tell but, you, I think there were so many takes and none of them just about could be used because at some point everyone was cracking up. Right, but every time it come, the camera goes on him, he, he seems like he does something different. <laughs> and, and, and part of that is what's cracking everybody up. Uh-huh. They're expecting one thing from him like he had done previously in the scene, but... He does something else. Whenever Elizabeth is trying to say hello to him and to Inga, he, just the look <laughs> on his face is different every time, and it cracks her up. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's a testament, if you go watch some of the outtakes, on how strong Madeline Kahn tries to hold oh. from breaking. It's like you can tell she's like, oh, I swear to God, I'm going to lose it. It's amazing. <laughs> Tim, what are your thoughts on Marty Feldman, or specifically even Marty playing Igor? Well, I love him as Igor. I don't, I, you know, I, I really don't know a lot of his other work, to be honest. I, but uh, he, he certainly is perfect for that role. And all of his little non sequiturs and, and, and little under his breath one liners and stuff, they kind of make the film a lot funnier for me. And and they they temper it too because Walt well, we've we've noticed several times they've taken moments out that he was supposed to say or probably did say and they realize you know what we we don't want to ruin sort of what's happening in this moment if it's a dramatic moment or something so they were very good in the editing process of not putting too many in there so the ones that are left sort of have a, a nice zinger zing feeling like it's like a good zinger yeah they find the good one. The, the best one they do and i, I am uh, i can't wait to get to the next minute because i we do want to talk about some of those outtakes that jeff mentioned because it he's just incredible 
All right, well, as we wrap up here, minute number 86. Guys, do you have anything in your notes? Either one of you, I'll go to you, Jeff, first. Do you have anything in your notes for this minute that we forgot to hit or something you wanted to circle back around and, and touch again? No, the, the put on the tie line <laughs> was one of the big ones I had underlined in my notes. Just throw some clothes on, buddy. <laughs> your wife's almost here. <laughs> yeah, your fiance. Keep that yeah. in mind, too, the fiance. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> never really what you want to hear, is it? <laughs> tomorrow, it's going to be funny if you don't pay attention. Gene Wilder has a, whole, a hard time saying fiance. Tim, what about you for this minute? God, the the thing that, again, what I, what I was doing when I was watching the film again – and especially in those minutes, it's just paying attention to the scenery like I never have before watching this film. And I've seen it a bunch of times. It's just been years. So I'm thinking of when the car comes up again, I'm stuck in my head. How did how did the car get up there so quickly? <laughs> again, going back to the telegram, how did she get there so quickly? There's a lot of unanswered questions that really, you know, don't need an answer. But there's a lot going on in that one scene. And, and that's my takeaway is how did this happen? How did that happen? How did this happen? So fantastic. Well, you know, don't forget we had the inspector drive his car up here too so it must be a decent enough driveway to get up there i don't know yeah. or there's a good car rental place right <laughs> at the top of the hill jed's tow truck just sitting at the bottom of the hill you need a tow we'll take you need a tow wait what kind of tow depending it's transylvania yeah. i'll right. get you a tow you may be very careful about what you're asking for i can find you a tow this afternoon abnormal tow. <laughs> yes what kind of tow do you want all right well walt do you have anything left in your notes no i think we could uh we could probably talk all day about this minute but i i I'm really looking forward to the next one. Well, since it bleeds so seamlessly into the next minute, we want to keep these guys around and keep talking about this. So before we do, Jeff, well, actually, they'll go to you first, Tim. Where can folks learn a little bit more about your podcast? And maybe if they are a radio fan, where can they catch you most mornings? Well, they can hear the Radio Labyrinth podcast by going to iTunes and finding Radio Labyrinth or go to our Facebook page, Radio Labyrinth. And you can hear me Monday through Friday on the Von Hessler Doctrine with Eric Von Hessler, who is the host, Man of a Thousand Voices, more like 312. But <laughs> that's um, Monday through Friday on WSBAM. Uh, in Atlanta, uh, 750 AM, AM or FM 95.5. And you can grab the t uh, WSB radio app, or you can use the tune in radio app to listen wherever you're catching this podcast. It's Eastern time, nine to 11 AM every morning. And it is some really good, funny stuff. They're dealing with a lot of the politics of the day, but in a very unique and sort of a round table, laugh out loud, funny way, way of doing it. Well, that's good. Yeah. Walt, <laughs> where can people learn a little bit more about us? Best place to find us is on our Facebook page at uh, facebook.com slash the Wilder Ride. From there, you can join the listeners group and get involved in the conversation going on. And uh, there's so much uh, great conversation there dealing with both the minutes that we're talking about and also some of the other works of Gene Wilder and some of the other folks in the movie. So uh, a great place to come, hear a lot more about Gene Wilder and all his, of his antics. Well, we want to invite everybody to come back back again tomorrow then for the continuation of this scene. We'll start minute number 87 with the rest of Dr. Frankenstein's line because all we heard was duck and he will finish that darling and Elizabeth will say surprised to which Freddie responds surprised and Elizabeth will end the minute with what exactly is it that you do do <laughs> when we next come back on the wilder ride. Walt, I told you never interrupt me when I'm working in here. <laughs> Can I borrow your cigarette? You need my cigarette? <laughs> no, not that one. That's not my cigarette. <laughs> That's not the cigarette I have in my hand. Leave me alone. You're so weird. <laughs>